Welcome, Rob. Delighted to have you on Coffee for Scalers. Um, Rob, uh, Rob Gable is someone I've known for the last seven, eight years now. It's coming up to. And uh, founded Tubular, an unbelievable wealth of experience in the creator economy. Tubular then. So what was the initial idea there? And uh, how did you get it started? Yeah. So at Machinima, which is about 80 or 90 people, it was largely a studio and a, and a partner organization, right? So it was really fun. People were running around with foam swords, dressed up in costumes, constantly filming, editing, writing. I just loved being in that creative space. I had only worked at tech companies. I hadn't really worked at like a, a Hollywood, more to Hollywood type studio. And they were also trying to figure out how to make content, you know, on a, on a shoestring budget compared to Hollywood. And there were a lot of people there from G4 and from, you know, movie studios. Um, So there, one of my jobs, although it was to get monetization up, was to pull a lot of the data together. And I was fielding questions from everyone. And sometimes it felt like there was a line outside the door of my office from every department. So the CFO would ask me, hey, Rob, I know we're doing a billion views a month in gaming, but how many is YouTube? Is it 10 billion and we're 10%? Is it 100 billion and 1%? Because I'm raising money right now. And the investors want to know what our, our potential is. You know, I went to Comscore, I Googled, see if YouTube had anything. There's like no information about that, right? The yeah. sales team would say, hey, we want to prove that if we get a trailer for the Green Lantern movie or a superhero movie, do we get more views to that trailer than IGN when they put that same trailer up or movie clips? Like, who's the leader? There was nowhere to turn to, right? There were a couple early sites like VidStatsX and Social Blade, but they weren't organized. You couldn't pull up any kind of data and nothing at the video level, nothing. There was no yeah. competitive intelligence available at all at the video level um, and so on and so on. But uh, the talent team wanted to say, hey, Rob, who are the fastest growing gamers? We want to sign them to our network. And like, we just couldn't find these things. So we went to, you know, I think a great business signal is when people are, are doing it, but they're doing it clumsily. Right. So yeah. we hired a bunch of people in Upwork in the Philippines and every day they would go on and they would enter how many videos, you know, our trailer had for Call of Duty's new game versus IGN. And we just did these manual workarounds, which was helpful. We would show it to brands. We, you know, um, but ultimately uh, I ended up leaving Machinima to move to Northern California for a really important project with Netflix. And I remember New Year's Eve 2011, I was on the phone. Yeah. And- Alan Debevois, who is CEO of Machinima, and we left on good terms. And he said, hey, Rob, you know, if you're not going to come back to Machinima, if you're going to live in Northern California, I had moved my family. Yeah. What about starting a company that will give not only Machinima all this information about the market and content creators, you know, uh, help, help us sell brand integrations, but do that for lots of other companies. He's like, every company is going to want this. I'm an investor in Dance On and Style Hall in um, Awesomeness TV, but also Lexus is going to want to know this information. CBS is going to want to know this information. And so I thought that was a really interesting idea. And over the next six months in 2012, I began consulting to Dance On and consulting to Awesomeness TV. I got a call from Awesomeness TV on a Tuesday and uh, Margaret Laney, if she's watching, was the CMO. And she said, hey, you don't know me. My name is Margaret Laney. I'm working for Awesomeness TV. It's kind of like the new Nickelodeon. We're launching on YouTube in two days with 13 different shows aimed at 13 to 17 year olds, primarily girls. And we're a little concerned. No one's going to watch it. Can you help us look at the analytics? Can you help us run marketing campaigns? And so I I literally helped them from the moment they launched. They were wildly successful and sold to Hearst and and ultimately Viacom. Um, Yeah. Was that and a brand so, new company like Awesomeness TV at that brand, point in time? Brand, brand, brand new, new, right? Brian Robbins was a longtime Hollywood producer of movies like Varsity Blues. Yeah, he, uh. if, This is the way back engine. But one of the first youth, famous YouTubers was a kid called Fred from Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, he used to put on the squeaky voice or maybe he had the squeaky voice. Yeah. Right? And, and how crazy is this? Because I feel like the rest of the world just had this experience in 2020 with COVID when they were locked at home and they finally saw these executives at brands and studios, what their kids were doing and watching in 2009, 11 years earlier, Brian Robbins was in a hotel room in DC and he turned on the TV and his kids asked him to turn it off. They were watching YouTube and they were watching Fred and he was like, and they were, I think are, you know, preteens or teens. And he's like, this is fascinating. I need to understand this better. And he leaned early on, uh, visionary really, 
ended up building out the business model for Awesomeness TV, which was to prototype TV shows online on YouTube using YouTube stars like Bethany Moda. He actually ended up making some Fred movies, uh, by, by the way, with Fred and, and was one of the oh, first did he? people. Wow. Yeah. First people to lead. And they did really well, like uh, on TV, direct to TV. I think one did 25 million in the theaters. So he's really one of the first person to, to take these YouTube stars and, and create premium content around it. Um, you know, now he ended up, now I think he's running Paramount Studios, you know, uh, back yeah. again for, for, for Viacom CBS. I was just looking up as well, like that awesomeness TV gang, like Kelly Day, who you know obviously really well. Now she's VP of International Prime Video. Like some of those awesomeness TV people uh, really went on to be like our leaders in the industry now, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And, you know, it was, I heard this from my friends in TV at the time. I had a friend who worked on a, you know, I was living in LA, so you meet some people. And he was working on a TV, cable TV show. It's like every year, 15% fewer people watch this TV show. Yeah. So like every year it makes a little less money and every year I'm going to make a little, and I just don't see where this ends. You know, he's like, I need an off ramp to YouTube, but the revenue on YouTube was like a 50th per minute or a hundredth per minute of TV. And so when, when Brian was starting, you know, uh, awesomeness TV or anyone trying to do that, it was like, how do we create engaging content that people want to watch at a fraction of the price of Hollywood? Um, and yet have some sort of future to it, right? That there's a there, there, that we can create movies or that, we, that we'll get TV yeah. shows. The irony now, what's different now than back 10 years ago is that no one's even really thinking the way I'm going to monetize my fame and audience on YouTube is to create a TV show. Now it's like, I'm going to create a yeah. burger line. I'm going to create energy drinks. I'm going to create clothing line, a beauty line, right? Like I'm going to create a billion dollar fashion brand. I don't need to be an actor on yeah. a TV show, right? <laughs> you know, in yeah, fact, crazy. a lot of actors on TV shows are like, Hey, I'm going to create that billion dollar clothing line, that billion dollar alcohol brand. Right. So uh, that's the biggest change now is I think back in 2010, the end goal was using YouTube to get to TV. Mm. And now it's um, now it's just bypassed that direct to consumer. Yeah. And yeah. a question for you. Um, oh, you were in between roles, right? When you started Tubular. So like, did you kind of need to be in between roles to start it or to, to be like that itch of being an entrepreneur or would you've done it if you hadn't, if you'd yeah. be in a more permanent job? That's a fascinating question. Everyone's got their own personality. Whatever I'm in, I throw myself into about 100%. I, I have a hard time having any side hustles. So for yeah. me, I wouldn't have been able to incubate the idea or, or spend time side hustling. Uh, I also never thought I would start a company. And if any of you are out there and you're like, wow. I'm never going to start a company, don't really sell yourself short. I was always happy being like the number two person. I was camera shy. I didn't want to be on TV. This would have horrified me. 12 years ago, <laughs> even talking to you, but, but, uh, no, seriously, um, you know, I would get like stage fright and stuff, but, and actually tubular helped me overcome that. I can talk about that in a story in a minute. This probably won't work. <laughs> it's just the reality. Those are the odds. But if it doesn't work, I will have learned what I want to learn. I'll have met the people I want to meet and I'll have explored some things I want to explore. And so I really can't lose Right. Yeah. If it doesn't work out, I I will just have had the experience I want to have. And I just had to have the faith that if it didn't work out, there would be other jobs, maybe at an awesome yeah. TV or maybe at YouTube or Machinima that That's I would cool. become qualified for. Yeah. Because I went through this process of intensively trying to build something in an industry I cared about. Yeah. And I it ended up working of- out. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And but I think for a lot of people with that, right? A lot of people are like, okay, maybe I'll try something. And then it's like, oh, do I have enough runway for me or my family or whatever to take that risk? Uh, Did you kind of have a bit of runway where you were like, no, I'm okay, I can do a year or so? Yeah, I did. You know, I actually did consider starting a company in 1999, 2000. It was the dot com boom. I was really young. Um, But I realized I don't know any VCs. I don't know any engineers. Like, I don't, I don't really know anything. And this is now there's a lot of ways to meet those people and there's a group blogs and yeah. there's all kinds of, you know, notion documents, all kinds of stuff. Um, 
you know, then you have kids, it's a little harder. You know, it's, you know, you could start a company yeah. when your kids are like two and four years old. It's just harder. So, yeah, yeah you know, what I was fortunate, I uh, went to work for a company that raised 14 million that was intact that sold for 400 million. So it was a thing. And I was one of the top, you know, sort of five executives there that gave me some credibility. Those people ended up being angel investors, being on the board of Machinima, the CEO, Alan was an investor in that company and on the board of, to, of lower my bills. So I had built up a network of people yeah. that did angel investing. I had bu built up um, a, at that point, 10, 12 years experience in the internet space and some skills yeah. that were useful, you know, in uh, monetization, in online direct response marketing and in product management. So I had a network, I had some skills, I had access to capital. Um, and mm. in the case, you know, fortunately enough, you know, that Netflix project actually had a built in severance that I was able to create some space with. So, yeah, yeah, look, I think one of the unfortunate things is that people who have a network and, and have access to capital are able to take more risks than those who don't. Yeah. It's just a little unfair if you're born into wealth and yeah. connection. It's very easy to start a business when you're 2021. 20, it's a lot harder if you come from you know, a rural part of a foreign country and, you know, you maybe don't even speak the language of most venture capitalists. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, anyone yeah. can make that journey. And I would just say, be patient. And the other yeah. part is a friend advised me this and it was really wise advice. I was about to start tubular. He said, Rob, don't start tubular because you want to start a company. Yeah. Don't do it for that reason. Sense. Don't do it for that reason because you'll tire. It won't be enough to get you through the darkest days. And there's always ups yeah. and downs. Start a yeah. company because you passionately want to see the problem solved and you're, you're willing to kind of go through walls and willing to be irrational, Yeah, you know, to, uh, on this. And I think like the willingness to get a little irrational, hey, you know, at, at super scale, it's what Elon Musk, it's a little irrational to want to, you know, put people on the moon it's a little, or on Mars. It's a little irrational to think that you can compete with GM and Ford when no one successfully did for 80 years. Right. Mm. And so you have to have that passion in, in that area. Yeah. To give it I think shot. as well. And I think what you said earlier, where you said founder market fit is kind of similar to that. Like yeah. you love data. So it was like, you just kind of like, we were talking about LinkedIn earlier, if you're like posting to LinkedIn and stuff or, or this, you gotta be passionate about doing something that you're gonna do again and again, cause it's hard. And if you don't have yeah. that passion, oh, it's gonna be tough at the start. So it's hard, yeah. you know, and look, I was the type of person who, even though I was consulting maybe 12 hours a week for, for style hall, uh, Saturday mornings, I would check the AB tests. I would check the results. Cause I just like, yeah, that was fun yeah, for yeah. me. Grab a bagel. You know, what do I want to do on a Saturday morning? <laughs> yeah. I want to, I want to see, you know, which messaging is working better Work and good. which video yeah. is working, has the lowest cost per view. So everyone's yeah. got their own thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, uh, so with Tubler for the viewers, I think pretty much everyone who's watching this will probably know Tubler. See, the two of us are talking as well. But, uh, um, oh, what kind of scale did it get to for anyone who doesn't know Tubler Labs? Yeah, so you know, Tubular works with hundreds and hundreds of customers that pay somewhere between thirty thousand dollars and over a million dollars a year. You know, so the revenue is is quite up there in the eight figures and uh, over a hundred people, offices yeah. in six countries. And it's a pretty big, pretty big operation all in all. Yeah, great. And with um, something you mentioned earlier with the your contacts with VCs and everything, and I think a lot of people are interested who have tuned into Copy for Scaler so far, is like yeah. raising money in, um, now you've worked a lot in the creator economy space and that yep. that space is booming. And, and Tubler, you raise money. Like, how do you go about actually, so you have the contacts now, and then how did you go about actually raising it? Did you put a business plan together or, or uh, talk, talk to the audience about that? Yeah, I did. I put the sort of 12 to 14 page deck together that was common at the time. I know people are doing like Notion documents now. Um, and I went out, I think at like Guy Kawasaki, there was, you know, the format, right? The problem yeah. statement, the solution. Um, I really think though that your business plan or your fundraising document needs to have sort of two portions the first one is there's a problem and a solution and a big market and so this is a big idea right yeah. and the vc is like yep this is a big idea but the second half of your document needs to be why is my team the one who's going to win this idea because cool. even if a vc goes oh i love this idea you know whether it's uber or tubular or whatever right but 
are you the horse I should bet on? And they're going to go look and see what other people are out there working on this idea and they need to, you know, to make a bet on your team. And so, um, one, that's why I think in the, in the early days, the amounts are small, one, three, five million. It's just not known who else is working on this. Could be a bunch of people in their garage. Mm -hmm. Um, two, they need to kind of see if your team can deliver, but, um, yeah, always don't skip the why us, you know, um, whether it's technology, experience, team, traction, you know, but Advice. they're going to need to know both. Yeah. Uh, and, and then it's, and, go oh, ahead, and in Jeff. terms of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. So in terms of raising the first amount of money, I didn't have enough money to bankroll it myself, uh, myself and Matt Coffin, who I had worked with. He was the CEO of Lower My Bills, where I worked, Alan Dubavaz. The Shinimo where I work, so two of my foremost, we each threw in $15,000, got $45,000. Uh, then I hired a, a developer, Stas, in Ukraine, still works at two. Hey, Stas. <laughs> yeah, hey, Stas. <laughs> uh, to, to develop some prototypes. And then very quickly, Allison came on as co founder, Allison Stern, co founder and first employee. Um, so raised a seed a round of funding. And this, I think, is actionable advice for you scalers out there as well. Mm. At one startup I had worked at, I was not a founder, but I came on as like employee 12. It didn't work. And when we did a retrospective on why it didn't work, we kind of missed a big opportunity. We were looking at lead generation in mature markets like education and in mortgages. Whereas I think this technology would have been much better suited to be uh, mobile and to kind of help do the lead generation for any brand awareness campaign. Like you saw a Range Rover ad now felt this form or right. Or you uh, Mm. are interested in old spice. Now here's a coupon, but Mm. we didn't know about Madison Avenue. We didn't know mobile. And I think that um, we just were missing DNA. So I was having a conversation with Matt Coffin, who was helping pull the company together. And he said, well, Rob, a great way to add DNA that you and Allison and Stoss don't have is let's go find angel investors who, who have that knowledge. So hmm. we said, okay, what are the areas that for tubular, given its unique you know, value proposition to be successful? We said, look, we need people who know YouTube. We know people who, know, who know, need to know Hollywood. We need people who need to know Madison Avenue. We need people who in the Bay Area have an engineering network because I hadn't only been in the Bay Area for 12 months. Um, hmm. We want people who know venture capital, right? Um, there might've been a sixth. And so I went and kind of, made a list of people Matt knew, Alan knew, I knew, who fell into one or more of those five or six buckets. And over Hmm. a four month period of time, I ended up finding at least two angel investors that put 10, 20,000, $50,000 into Tubular. So we had a $600,000 seed round. And um, those people today have become some of my closest friends, closest networks. And we were really able to tap into them at critical moments. So um, it was one of the smartest things that I did. Uh, For example, Dean Gilbert was the chief operating officer of YouTube. YouTube. He was retiring. And when I pitched him, he validated the deal. I like it. We're going to need these sort of enterprise measurement and marketing tools for YouTube. Um, And then he introduced me to other people, right? Or, um, you know, whether in the on the engineering or in the sort of nose engineers in the Bay Area, there was Ben Ling and Gokul Rajaram. And so, um, Those 10 people who become on your startup team, you start leveraging all their networks as well. And so we could have raised $600,000 much faster for one or two individuals, but we would have had a much smaller extended team. And when you're a four person startup to have 12 angels on your side in the right mix, game changer. Yeah. Game changer of knowledge. Yeah. You think that was critical, like for anyone out there, you think getting that initial team is critical to success? I think so. You know, for example, um, some of the engineering people, Eshwar, he was a successful CTO from three or four uh, sales. When I was hiring a CTO, I didn't know what to look for. So he helped do the technical vetting for them. Right. Great, great example. Yeah. Cool. Um, what was I going to say? Actually, in retrospect, the one thing I would have added probably was an enterprise sales uh, VC or uh, yeah. uh, we yeah. didn't we didn't have enterprise really on the radar at the time. We thought we would sell for everywhere from 100 to 1000 bucks a month. Um, so I didn't do that. But again, that would have been another area that 
that would have been very helpful to have had someone. So think about what kind of capabilities you need to build, um, what type of markets you're going to be in, what type of partnerships you're going to have, what, what type of ultimate acquirers might there be for your company, and think about bringing those people in early as angels. And one I, other actionable tip, I think, for you early stage people is these people are much more valuable than just money. Right. So one person cuts you a five hundred thousand dollar check or 10 individuals can give you fifty thousand dollars and their time, knowledge, experience. So one thing you could do is make them an advisor and give them a little bit of equity so, or, and have them make the investment. So make them an advisor and have them make an investment. So I'll give you 0.1 percent of the company over two years for your advice and then you'll invest an equal amount for 0.1 percent. And so they basically have double the shares they would have if they were just money. Yeah, but they're more than but they're more than just money. What do you think though about like people where they're thinking about making sure to keep enough equity when you're small, so that like when you need to raise in two or three rounds, that you've enough equity left and stuff to raise? Or yeah, what's your thought process or advice for people out there with that? I would say you want to have a slice of a really big pie. Yeah, and you want your idea, your baby, your dream to be as big as possible. And so if you're focused on the size of your slice, you're not focused on the right thing. You need to be focused on the size of the pie. Yeah. So, so I think being generous, especially with individuals, individual angels, employees, be generous there. You know, um, I think you should, you know, be wary of dilution, but you know, do you want to own, I know Dropbox, I think famously, maybe Drew owned 4% when they went public. Mm. If you act, you know, but it's Dropbox. Yeah. You know, there's probably a lot of people who own 80% of startups we'll, we'll never hear about. Yeah, cool. And actually with Dropbox, where you just said it's Dropbox, with Tubular, something I've noticed, like after leaving and everything, I actually, like anyone who's in the online video domain, pretty much everyone has heard of the company or like, I, I think people yeah. really think of like premium when they think of tubular, um, the message, like not messaging, but just like branding. And uh, uh, I think tubular has done a really good job of branding. Um, and how did, how did it do, do that? Or were you really passionate about branding or was it? Yeah. yeah. Talk to us about that. I think branding is very simple. Consistently over delivering on the brand promise. It's really not <laughs> that complicated. Uh, we were fortunate early on that some of the first tubular products created wow moments. I, I'm just okay. lucky, lucky, right? But we would sit down when we were three people and we would go to see, I remember seeing Zach James at Zephyr. We went to see a couple people at YouTube and yeah. you entered a channel and within minutes we showed you these are the most famous influential people have ever liked or commented on that channel. And they mm. were like, I can't believe this. Like I remember Zach, if you're out there, I mean, he literally pounded his fist and F yes, this is what we need. Right. <laughs> That's validation. Uh, we had a very similar result. I remember going to see some people at YouTube and they were like, I've been saying we need to make this for years and years and years. We haven't made it. And when you get that kind of energy, cause I had been in other pitches at startups where people said, yeah, this is interesting. I might use this, right? They're being nice and maybe they would use it. But, you know, if you see people's eyes dilate when you yeah. show them a mock-up <laughs> or a prototype, you know, yeah. then you're on to something, right? But then after yeah. that, you know, it was very much like, how do we put our energy into things that, that create wow moments where people are excited? And they started to tell people like, oh my God, you need to take a look at Tubular. I remember Me Too was a um, Hispanic-oriented Latino MCN, and they were trying to find influencers on YouTube who had a like Latino audience, but not Spanish language channel. And so they had people and they're surfing YouTube and they're, they're searching for keywords, you know, Latino this or that. And they had found some interesting people. Tubular had this lookalike technology that would say, give us a creator and we'll, we'll show you the next 100 or 500 creators who have an overlap with that audience, it turns out that that's a really great way to find lookalike creators. And so we simply said, hey, do, who are three or four of these creators who have this audience you're talking about? And like, do you know those? Oh, sure, it's these three people. Plug them in, boom, 200 similar creators, exactly what they're looking for, you know, 
Mm. Where do I write the check? And so I really think that that branding, it's not about the name. It, it, it's a little bit about the design and the promise. It, it's about being consistent, but really at the end of the day, any product or service that consistently overachieves expectations yeah. will, will have a strong brand. Yeah. And I say that like, like I, like I, um, I, I was talking to someone very senior on YouTube actually today, uh, just randomly. And I was like telling them that I was ex tubular and they're like, Oh yeah. Do you know, Alison? <laughs> and I was yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, there was someone else last week that was someone, uh, yeah, in the space. And it's just like instantly people kind of know it. So yeah, cool. That's a good one. Yeah. And, um, you know, especially early on, leave money on the table if you can. It's one reason you take VC money. Yeah. Famously, the Zoom founders, right? Zoom was an amaz- is obviously an amazing product, uh, high quality, you know, low lag, all kinds of stuff. But the CEO is like, I'm just going to underprice. I'm going to leave money on the table. It needs to mm-hmm. be both, you know, a great product and a great deal. And, and then it will grow like wild and I'll have to spend a lot less money on marketing. The best brands spend less money on marketing, right? Yeah. Tesla spends, I think, like no money on marketing. Starbucks mm. famously for the first 10, 15 years didn't spend any money on marketing. Google didn't spend any money on marketing. You don't have to spend a lot of money on marketing because people are sharing and talking about this amazing experience and this new thing you just got to try. I, I think one of the biggest compliments I ever got, I remember when Condé Nast when they first saw Tubular said, this is like the first time I saw Google Maps. <laughs> and I didn't know that a map could do that. But when yeah. I found out it could, like, you can't have this back. You will have yeah. to pry this from, she said, from my cold, dead hand, you know? Yeah. That kind of validation is amazing. And so then it's like, well, what do you like about it? You know, how, what is, what's really driving this, this um, emotional reaction? So we were fortunate, you know, we got in early, we created some wow moments and, um, you know, tried to be innovative. Yeah, cool. And with Tubular, like uh, you were saying about starting the business X years ago and everything, and now that you know so much more, uh, looking back, is there anything you would have done differently or changed in any way? Oh, I mean, there's a million little things along the way that I, I would have changed. Um, I'll tell a couple stories. One story. <laughs> so, you know, I, I said I had gone out and found these 12 angel investors. It was a lot of effort, much harder than raising money from one person. And right when I got to the end of that seed round, I got a preemptive term sheet from another VC who wanted to put $4 million in. And that kicked off, which is fortunate, great problem to have, kicked off another couple of months of raising this ended up just being, I think, two and a half million dollars. So over six, seven months while I'm building the company, I've been constantly fundraising. I was so exhausted. And then one of our investors, um, I'm just going to protect the names here said, Hey, you need to come into my VC, very famous VC and let pitch. And we'll put a little bit of money in too. You're going to want all the connections. And I said, I'm so tired. I can't fly to LA. He goes, just fly in on Monday, come to the partner meeting. You're going to get additional investor. We're going to be super helpful to you. And I was like, I'm just, I can't, I, I'm just, I'm spent. And I kind of wish I had just sucked it up. And just gone down there, you know, because again, the getting more people on your team really can be helpful. So that's probably one thing that I would have done differently. Um, I think, you know, people are everything in the early days of a startup. And we had fantastic people, Allison Stern and Stoss and and you you came along, right? Uh, In the very early days. And um, just, I think every time you hire you know, just making sure you really get that, the sort of the best, especially in the other days, the best generalist you can get Um, because the strongest founding teams, you know, you look at PayPal, right? I mean, if you could kind of luck into that, like, you know, you've got 12 future CEOs in your 12 person founding team, you know, it really is going to be magical. I can't, I don't regret any of the hires we made, but I think, you know, just really focus on, on sort of getting that, that best initial team you can get. Um, when you start scaling, now we're talking scaling, start focusing on culture a little earlier. Um, you know, a company, 20, 25 people, there's all this research out there, but you know, 20, 25 people, you run very differently. You get to 60 people, you need to start having an executive team, holding themselves responsible, building departments. Not every decision runs to the CEO. And mm. 
you'll have people who have been at the company for three months hiring other people who have been at the company for three weeks. And so really codifying early on, what are your values? What do you call yourself? We, it took us about five years before we decided we were tubies at Tubular. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and it was like- Hey, all tubies out there, leave a comment hey, and like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe. But, <laughs> but, you know, and Samina gets all the credit for this. She's like, we really have to name ourselves. I didn't know why you need to name yourself. And when you're 10, 20 oh, yeah. people- when you're essentially people, you don't really need to name yourself. You're, you're by de facto the tribe, right? But, but I think, you know, even giving your team a name, you know, um, goes a long way to kind of creating some code. Because then it's like, okay, well, okay, if I'm a Tubi, what does that mean? How do I act? What yeah. do I do? You know? Uh, and so you know, there's, there's lots of things along the way. But I think Mark Zuckerberg gave the best advice, which is, you know, you can get lots of things wrong. Um, and you will get lots of things wrong. In fact, if you're experimenting, you better be getting lots of things wrong. Um, yeah. But, you know, are, did you get a couple of the big things right? And so I think that's it. You know, one, one thing Tubular maybe could have benefited more from in retrospect is our data is very valuable. Um, used over and over, great retention rate. But it's a little outside the flow of commerce. It's a little outside the flow of money, right? It's like, yeah. I use Tubular to figure out that I should, you know, put Snoop Dogg in my videos, not this other rapper, he'll work better. And that we should make, uh, when we're making prom videos, it's okay to post them in February because they take off then. Uh, I know the market size, but none of that's like really in the flow of money. So I remember somebody saying, hey, when you look at Adobe, uh, Omniture wasn't really in the flow of money. It was a good business. But when they got into A-B testing, you know, now you make the change and you, the cash register rings. The closer you are to kind of ringing the cash register, um, you know, I think it's a lot easier to charge for the value you create. And so I think that's why these fintech companies are worth lots and lots of money, right? Or sales mm. CRM companies like Salesforce, they're really close to the flow of money. Expensify yeah. is a great service and it helps save a little bit of money. It's a little bit a little, you know, trip actions, a little bit closer to the flow of money. Again, though, I would say do what you're passionate about. And if it's not, yeah. you know, being next to the cash register, then don't worry about being next to the cash register. But yeah. there probably are some things that Tubular could have done on the activation side of things that maybe would have uh, created a bigger business faster yeah. and, and yeah. a larger market size. So think yeah. about that as you're starting your business, you know, how close are you to the cash register and how close should you be? Yeah. And I think you're right. If you're selling to... Um... If it's B two B sales, like what departments are are does a lot of investment go into? So sales, a lot of investment goes into acquisition, sales and marketing. Yeah. But marketing can get turned off sometimes, but sales is hard to turn off. So yeah, yeah. Or think about it this way: you know, Jelly Smack right now is famously doing a great job at taking YouTubers and helping them grow their audience on Facebook. Um, if your service was recommendations mm. on how to grow on Facebook, you could maybe charge, you know. Five hundred thousand dollars a month or two hundred dollars an hour, but you know if they take somebody and suddenly within twelve months that that person is generating four million dollars a year on face, Facebook or ten million dollars a year on Facebook, they can take a percentage of that, right? Like yeah. they're closer to the money. Some of those mm -hmm. things don't scale as well. I think you know I always focus on software that would scale without many people that has very very high margin, um, you know. But but there are ways to sort of you know be mm. closer to the money. Um, then maybe a little further away and sort of recommendations, um, you know, can, can sometimes fall a little further from the cash register versus, Hey, I'm going to give myself a recommendation and take that action on your behalf, but it tends yeah. to be more manual too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Actually, Jelly Smack, one of the hottest companies in the creator economy right now, actually, I saw your post the other day, like, uh, what is it? 1.4 billion was invested in creator economy, uh, in 2021. Yeah, 2021. It was probably more afterwards. Patreon, Cameo, Substack, Masterclass. Yeah, but any companies that you think are doing a phenomenal job out there? Maybe not as big as the likes of Patreon or others. Yeah. Well, there's so many. You mentioned a couple of the leaders. One that I've been consulting to and I'm really enjoying is Spotter. So Spotter mm. provides... So you're a YouTuber and you're a full-time YouTuber. Maybe you have a team. You're successful. Creating lots of value. But there's a fundamental problem which is if i am a tv studio and i shell and i sell a, a show to hbo or netflix i'm paid then right but when yeah. i'm mr beast and i make the squid games video and i spent three and a half million dollars i put it up on youtube 
I'm paid over the next five years by YouTube or 10 years, right? And so how do you invest time and energy in any kind of big way when the money trickles in over years and years and years and years? So like small businesses or, or, business, or even the industrial revolution was financed by JP Morgan, the technology revolution is financed by Silicon Valley Bank and VCs, right? You have these creators that can create immense value, but are cash constrained. So what can they do? They can get debt, but you know, that's personal debt for them and it's risky. Um, some people are selling 5% of their future income for the next 30 years. This is something that like Creative Juice is doing, which I think is really innovative uh, as well. But Spotter mm -hmm. came up with a really cool uh, product, which is we will license the future ad revenue of your back catalog of videos. So all the videos you've made up until the beginning of the month, we'll give you a lump sum today. And it's the biggest check these creators have ever seen. $2 yeah. million, dollars, $5 million dollars or more. We'll give you that check now. We will collect the ad revenue from YouTube over the next five years, but you can now take this money and you can invest in yourself. You can launch new channels. You can hire editors, writers, so that you can produce more videos. Um, there's a company out there. I don't know that I'm allowed to say it, but they took spotter money in March of last year. They doubled their video output. They quadrupled their revenue and they made they made we're making so much more money just four or five months later than they were making before they even took the spotter cash it was with that investment miss and if you yeah. if you go to spotter.la mr beast has done several deals with them and i think the public case study is he went and um is now creating 30 foreign language versions of his channel so there's beast reacts i saw the spanish Espanol, one. yeah beast brazil right and these are now becoming a big chunk of his revenue and so he's taking the money hiring really high quality dubbers and mm -hmm. reposting his old video content so some people have created studios some people have um uh, increased their their team you know maybe you hire a couple people yeah. to only do to only do th thumbnail tasks using like a tube buddy for yeah. example or or even a vidIQ and now, and now you're making more money. So there are so many creators out there. They're already successful. They've already made it to full-time YouTuber or more. Yeah. If they have a little bit of money or more time that money will give them, they can create insane value, launch a new energy drink or something. So that's one mm. company I'm super bullish on. Um, I'm really interested in social commerce. I think that when... Today, there's amazing platforms to build your audience, right? As an individual, you can compete with the largest um, TV shows just by like going on TikTok or going on YouTube, right? And then there are these amazing platforms to sell stuff like Shopify, mm. but they haven't really come together in the United States way they've come together in Asia. And when people can, and everyone's working on this right now, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, but I think when a creator can directly sell their own product or products they really believe in directly through YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I think that's going to unlock a lot of revenue for creators. I think it's going to be quite disruptive to influencer marketing and even regular brand advertising. Um, and I think it's really going to change things. So I think social commerce might be one of the biggest things. There's some people working on it. I'm starting to advise a company called Zelf, the Z E L F, but there's a lot of people working in social commerce. That's mm. a, a hot space that I'm very bullish on. I think the NFTs are real. I think they'll go way beyond, you know, collectible profile pics and art, um, you know, gaming, mm. and there's all kinds of membership uses of NFTs. Um, but I personally think that an NFT, a game that if I play it enough, I make money. Um, this already exists, right? Like if you play World of Warcraft enough, you can sell your sword. But um, I haven't found, you know, Axie Infinity is not really that fun. Uplander is not that fun. Sorry, guys, if you're working on this. But, but uh, I really think that sort of first fun Clash Royale style game where, you know, if you're good and you play, you can make money. I think that's fascinating. So um, there are companies out there that are working on the next generation of games that sort of whether it's a fantasy league for creators or whether it's just kind of a next generation of games. I think that some of that stuff um, will be. And, and so what's the common theme here that I just said? It's the, it's the convergence of economy and money, whether you're a spotter, making money in a game, selling social commerce. I'm really a deep, in, deep believer yeah. in, web, in Web3. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the lines. So what happened in Web2 the lines of TV used to be one way you watch it's passive. I watch a show. 
right? Then social media comes out. I watch the show. I talk about the show. I share it. I comment. I repost. I, in TikTok, I remix. I do challenges, right? It became interactive, but money was still on the side. You go to Patreon and some money happens, right? You add sense, money happens. The yeah. next step in Web3 is that money gets mixed into the interactivity and the engagement that videos have. And it just will be, um, it will allow tens of millions of people to make a living doing what they love at some intersection of media, entertainment, commerce, selling, advertising. It's just going to be a big interconnected ball. Yeah, what's been the part of your career you've enjoyed the most? I've really enjoyed taking the plunge into this sort of creator economy. I mean, when I decided to start Tubular, I thought I'm going to learn online video. I'm going to meet people at YouTube. I'm going to spend more time with these startups like Awesomeness TV. And, and, and that's been enriching in many ways. I've met lifelong friends, you know, whether they're kind of customers at, at yeah. Viacom or, you know, awesome or electronic arts or whatever. Um, you, you know, I met you yeah. through it. Uh, met Allison. You helped me buy this house that I'm in today, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like the hundreds of people who have worked at Tubular over the years think back about it fondly as a place where they learned and a place where they um, they grew, you know, and that they advanced in their careers. And so I, I, I feel satisfaction on that. Yeah. And yeah, I just, I really enjoyed the journey. Thank you so much, Rob, for coming on. I think some of the notes I took were like, if you're if you're starting a company yourself, make sure you have a good team at the start, the investors as well as the team. Uh, founder market fix is important. And the key to branding is dilating eyeballs. <laughs> dilating <laughs> eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. Consistently overachieving expectations. So there's two ways to do that. Low expectations or, you know, really dilating eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Dennis.